This program is being presented to you by the Heraeus International Winter School on Gravity and Light. So welcome to the actually last central lecture of the Winter School. Um, today we'll wrap up uh, these central lectures and I will actually uh, explain something I didn't explain to you namely why the Einstein action has the form it has. So we uh, took great care to explain how the entire structure of the theory uh, is founded from set theory over topology and so on. But uh, actually the Einstein action and hence the Einstein equations uh, were just presented. And in fact that's uh, one simple textbook view that one can take and that's often taken that the gravitational dynamics are postulated alongside the matter dynamics that are postulated as well. And you postulate them such that the result describes nature. And that's absolutely fine, that's absolutely correct. However, if you postulate several things, you've got to make sure that you don't postulate two things that are contradictory. And if indeed one can be derived from the other, or one is greatly constrained by the other postulate, then we should know in order to first understand the theory better, second in order to be sure that there are no contradictions, and third because such understanding usually points beyond what we already know in a concrete context, it yields a deeper understanding. So what I would like uh, to report about today is uh, the work by a whole number of people and um, the, it can be summarized at uh, answering the question how quantizable matter gravitates. Now, I don't know how many of you had a course on quantum theory in the universities? Okay, so you all know that there's this issue of you have a matter theory uh, and you want to quantize it in order to get the corresponding quantum theory. And it's a very complicated question how to quantize and whether that is a well-defined procedure in the first place and so on. So if here we speak about quantizable matter, it's not quantum matter, it's quantizable matter. We speak of the classical description of matter, no doubt about that. But it should be a classi classical description of matter that can be quantized. Now, uh, at least it needs to satisfy some necessary conditions for quantization because otherwise we would ultimately not consider it as a good matter model today because we, requ we require that all matter be quantizable. Now it will turn out that if you start with a quantizable matter model, like for instance Maxwell theory, electromagnetic waves, or well the whole theory, that the theory already carries in itself the information of how it gravitates. In other words, it carries in it the information that gravity should look like Einstein gravity. Um, I will explain this and I will explain it in a general context uh, that will also include other matter that could produce other gravity theories. So that's the idea of uh, these final lectures today. And um, so let me introduce you here. And today it will be less of a lecture style like usually that you have lots of indices to follow. Today it's about the ideas behind all of that. Of course there will be some technical detail but you're well prepared. So I would like to explain why gravity can be derived from given matter dynamics and need not be postulated. And of course uh, that makes a big difference that it can be derived from given matter dynamics. It has a massive impact on our thinking about gravity simply because if ever we have to consider different matter in the universe because it's discovered, we will maybe, and the talk will show you under which circumstances, have to consider different gravity theory. But the best thing is it will be constructive. So if there's new matter, we know exactly what to do, how to get the new gravity. So let me start with the standard model of fundamental physics that includes gravity and matter. And in fact, in this school, you were already quite well educated in that. So if you want to start doing physics and you talk about space and time, on which you want to put matter, and we're not questioning uh, this division, uh, then you start with some sets, then you may get the idea that you need some topology on there, 
if you want to do classical physics, that you want a smooth atlas and so on. And then you know <clears throat> at some point if you have enough structure, namely a smooth manifold, then you can start thinking about tensors and tensor fields. And tensor fields are at this stage of development the only matter you can put on a manifold, on a smooth manifold. Spinners, who have known, you know what, knows what the spinner is? Spin one half and so on. Spinners cannot be put on the manifold at this stage, but soon they will be. So um, you can put tensor fields, so vector fields, covector fields, and so on. So now this is the uh, conceptual foundation that you need to start with before you can start talking about the standard model of fundamental physics as we have it today. But now I would like to jump back to 1850 or 1860 when uh, Maxwell formulated his Maxwell equations. I don't think you can read this very well. So here it says, uh, we look at observations. So for instance, there was the observation that currents induce magnetic fields. That's uh, Ampere or something. And, pardon me? And, and, mo and moving magnets induce currents. Those were Ampere's and Faraday's law, and Maxwell combined them into the Maxwell equations, and uh, he added a little term and so on. But from a modern point of view, what he did, he built on the building as it is presented here, and he wrote down his Maxwell theory of electromagnetism. Of course, Maxwell didn't think of tensors really, and the smooth atlases and topologies and sets, not at all. Okay, but from a modern perspective, that is what he did. So that is where we are here, 1850, 1860, around that. Well, then the story, you know how it continued. In 1905, probably earlier, uh, Einstein stared at the Maxwell equations. And he realized that if these equations are true, and they ought to be true because they describe all kinds of phenomena that were known at the time, he saw... After all, that took a few years and the help of others, Minkowski and others, to realize actually on this, the space has a structure all by itself. It, it carries a geometric structure, which today we call a Lorentzian metric. Well, they thought of it first of a flat Lorentzian metric because that was the first thing you think about. But after all, the decisive observation was that something, some theory that came from observations dictated that you think of space-time this way. So this is the famous 1905 insight by Einstein. He didn't call it Lorentzian metric. He wrote down rather cumbersome equations. But if you really analyze it from there, it was actually just a logical conclusion. Now later, and that's now uh, 100 years ago, or 99 years and uh, 11 months or something, um, Einstein realized that this Lorentzian metric better also be given some dynamics because after all the metric coefficients feature in the Maxwell equations that you all saw the Maxwell action as coefficients but where do these coefficients come from you can brutally set them to zero but you can also give them some dynamics and what comes out is the dynamics of the background on which the theory lives on which the waves for instance propagate but if the background changes, then the waves propagate differently. And the propagation and the dynamics of this background was chosen such it captures the gravitational effects. So how, for instance, waves gravitate. Today we know the Einstein equations. They relate the, energy, uh, the Einstein curvature of space-time to the energy momentum tensor of the matter. And thereby they encode how the gra matter gravitates with itself, with other stuff, and so on. So this is... We started 1850, 1905, 1915, we arrived here. That's the picture. Now, there is one further ingredient to the story, and the further ingredient is spinorial matter. Actually, that shouldn't have vanished yet, but okay. Um, so if you have a Lorentzian metric, only then can you start talking about spino spinners or fermions on space-time. And in fact, the famous spin one-half is not a quantum mechanical thing, it's a thing, a, a concept that comes out of the representation theory of the isometry group of a flat Lorentzian metric, the so-called Poincaré group. It's a geometric thing, the spin, and in fact once you have a Lorentzian metric, you can, under certain circumstances, there are some uh, obstructions, but uh, uh, you, you can impose 
spinners on a manifold. So really the spinners come after the Lorentzian metric. Without Lorentzian metric you don't have spinners. Okay, so that, there's a logical uh, thing here going on. And now you have tensorial matter and spinorial matter and you can choose what in nature you want or you need to describe uh, by which. And it turns out that the spinorial matter is always fermions, so they have, they satisfy fermionic statistics, you know that probably from uh, statistical mechanics, and the tensorial matter encodes bosons. Now if you take the two together, we started here in 1850 with Maxwell's theory that was the kickstart. Everything that comes after the Lorentzian metric actually is based on what Einstein read in the Maxwell equations. But then you see you can have other matter and so on. So you take the Maxwell equations extremely seriously and the courageous step by Einstein was that the Maxwell equations are to be taken so seriously that what follows from them is the foundation of all of physics. He was very lucky that that is true. It could have been that the Maxwell equations only capture a little bit and there's much more out there. But in fact he did that and then today we formulate all matter in terms of the standard model of particle physics in terms of tensorial and spinorial matter where the spinorial matter firmly rests on the concept of Lorentzian metric. So all of this fits nicely together and uh, constitutes what today we call the standard model of fundamental physics, the standard model of gravity, the standard model of particle physics, and that is what any textbook wants to convey to you, and it's of course correct. It's an extremely successful theory, it's been extremely successful for a very long time. That's the standard model, and it's a little bit the logical path we followed in this course, apart from the spinorial matter, which we didn't do. Now, if we confront that with experiment, you already know, we calculated that in the cosmology uh, course, and you also heard it in Valeria Petorino's lectures, uh, we have a fact that the standard model matter that we so proudly describe by the standard model only constitutes about 5% of the matter and energy in the universe. So those are observations that now for uh, about 20 years uh, are more and more corroborated. So if you apply the model I showed to you before and you evaluate the raw data with that, you come to this conclusion. We know that. So that means that here the standard model dynamics, which here in this nice textbook picture, thrown up here at the same level with Einstein gravity dynamics and both have to be postulated and modeled to work together and everything is fine. Well, in fact, you have here 95% dark stuff. I call it disrespectfully dark stuff because we don't really know where that comes from, okay? Um, and it's, uh, well, the dark, uh, that's why it's called stuff. The dark thing is, of course, because it only interacts gravitationally. It couples to this background metric, one assumes, okay? And, um, uh, but it doesn't couple to any of the other standard model matter in here. So most of what is out there is not of standard model type. And by my argument, what is standard model type is actually Maxwell type right? You start with Maxwell, you come to there and you bootstrap the whole standard model of particle physics because you say all the matter has been created in the image of Maxwell theory, right? And now we have this situation and one logical possibility is that all that dark stuff, uh, somebody will come, will write it down in standard model style, the standard model will be extended in a very conservative way um, that would be actually preferable, of course, uh, and after all, the whole picture stays as it is. Just we do not know. We simply do not know. And um, so if we take that seriously that we don't know, and that's the right thing to do, then we have to delete everything I deleted now in the current textbook picture, because if the matter works fundamentally different from Maxwell and hence other standard model matter, then all the conclusions we drew from it are to be questioned. Of course, you can always question more. You can question whether you should have a smooth manifold. You could question whether you should have a topology at all. You should question, okay. The game here is we only question what we are prompted to question, but what we are prompted to question we take seriously. So we have to delete that. So it's virtually all I taught you. Now, <clears throat> the point is, what we should do, we should redo the whole thing. 
we should start with any matter, any new matter, any matter, not only Maxwell matter. But then, what do you mean by any, what do I mean by any matter? You can't make uh, write down theorems for any matter. There is not enough structure. So we need to make assumptions about the matter we expect to be out there, even if it's dark matter or dark energy, okay, or any yet to be discovered matter. And um, well, so if we now make assumptions, we can of course follow our taste. We can say, well, let's make an assumption. I like strings, okay? Let's do strings, or I like this, or I have. To, I always had this idea that physics should be done with purely complex numbers, right? You can have ideas like this. But again, I would um, rather go for some very conservative approach. I would say, let's only require of matter what we all agree on must be required. And um, that is probably, on the one hand, predictivity. So if we are still talking about classical matter theories, they should be predictive. If you come up with a new matter theory, say tomorrow you're down a theory for dark matter, and it's not predictive in the sense of that initial conditions are translated into later values of the field, it would be rejected outright by the physics community justifiably because physics is about predicting the future. So certainly we want matter, a matter model that's predictive. But the other really important input of what we learned in 20th century physics is that all matter is quantum. Well, at least so we believe. So if we make a classical matter model to fit it into here, it should at least be quantizable. You, it should not uh, obstruct quantization. If we make these two assumptions, and I will tell you how to make them technically, one can show, and I will illustrate this in this lecture, that that already gives rise uniquely to new tensorial geometry. So not a tensorial geometry described by a metric, by a Lorentzian metric, but possibly by all other kinds of tensors, but just not any tensor. Like a Riemannian metric would not do. But a Lorentzian does, and many others. I'll explain that. Now, of course, we're here kind of in 1905, if we repeat the history here. Now, what if we want to give this new tensorial geometry, which provides the coefficients of the matter equations, if you, and we must, provide dynamics? for that. Um, oh, well, they can have non-tensorial matter. And then you can provide dynamics, and indeed you get new gravitational dynamics. And if I have these arrows here, they don't mean, well, you should and one could. Uh, they mean we know how to do that. And I'll explain it. Okay. Uh, by the same token, of course, if you start here with Maxwell, what you need to do, you can now follow this in a modern way, and you arrive at Einstein gravity again. So at the same time, as it provides the path to new gravitational theory, starting from new matter, which you need to observe and formulate in equations, it provides you with a clean-cut explanation why, if you start with Maxwell theory on the one side, that you need to end up with Einstein gravity on the other side. Okay? So it's also an explanation of what we already have. So this is uh, the picture I want to convey. So the central result of today, I'll announce it in the beginning, is you start and you give me some predictive and quantizable matter equations in form of an action. So you're an observer, you watch out there, you see what not the bullet cluster, and you come up with a very bright idea of how to formulate what's going on there as a matter model, okay? As a local matter model. And you come and say, these are the equations for dark matter. We checked it here, here, here. What we see there locally, that is how it works. And then you say, however, there's a problem. This is my matter field, but unfortunately, I need coefficients it couples to that do not look like the coefficients of a Lorentzian metric. Well, maybe they do. Then everything is fine. But say you need coefficients that are different from a Lorentzian metric. And one possibility, for instance, would be the following. If you observed tomorrow, it's unlikely that you observe it directly, but to illustrate the point, if you, tomorrow you observe that there is a light ray out there in vacuum, and all of a sudden it splits into two, if you observe that, then general relativity with its Lorentzian metric is dead the same moment. 
We know such splitting of light rays from the laboratory. If you have a birefringent crystal and you send a light ray, it will split into its polarization components. Have you seen that? I'm sorry. It will split into its polarization components. In fact, while the vacuum is described by such a metric, such a linear medium is described by a fourth rank tensor. Okay? So one can show that. You trust me. So that means if you observe the same thing in the sky, then you need to write down a modified Maxwell theory with such a structure. Okay? So it's not like pure fantasy. One can very clearly write down phenomena that immediately mean the death of general relativity. So assume, nevertheless, you see this and you write down the new equations, then I claim from these equations, from this action, you can construct a linear homogeneous system of partial differential equations. A linear system. Uh, it has the slight disadvantage that it has infinitely many equations, but that doesn't shock us. I tell you, we know how to do that. It's a straightforward algorithm, no brain power required. You convert that into such a system. It's not the equations of motion for this. It's, it's a complicated way you uh, get the system. And once you have it, you solve it. Well, that, that's a little bit more tricky. But once you solve that system, and I'll talk about this system. All I tell you about today is how to get this system of PDEs and how you extract it from the matter equations. Once you have it, you solve it, and the solution is the Lagrangian of gravity that is required in order to be the background for this theory such that the theory is both predictive and quantizable. And that you need. That's the idea. And um, the familiar example is you put in the standard model action. So all the, the electrons and Maxwell and uh, uh, electroweak force and everything or just Maxwell is also good. You get a linear homogeneous PDE system, as I said, a particular one with particular coefficients. You solve it, and hooray, the Einstein action I introduced to you with undetermined gravitational constant, undetermined um, cosmological constant, which appear as integration constants when you solve this, is the solution. This would then be the reason, once I explain to you how this works, this is just the, the announcement of this result, this is then the explanation for the Einstein theory in if our matter is the standard model matter. Okay? So you don't need to postulate that separately. It's actually derivable. All right. And of course, the general principle is that you will look out there, not put in the standard model, but you put in what you really see. Well, that's a complicated business. You need to write down equations for that and so on. You put that in and you get the relevant gravity theory. Now you say, what if we see the standard model and other stuff? Well, that's then in total, it's a new matter theory and you get the relevant gravity theory, possibly a modification of general relativity. So let me explain to you in two steps of how this works. The first step, you need to understand the new matter and you need to understand the space-time structure that follows from it. If I say new matter, it could be the old matter, then we'll just have as a result the old space-time structure. And the key to all of this is something called the principal polynomial of the matter field equations. Whenever you have field equations, like Maxwell's equations, they are partial differential equations, and they can come from an action. Now, if you vary the action with respect to the matter field, which I just denote by a phi here, you will invariably arrive at a partial differential equation for the matter field. So there are many derivatives acting on the matter field, and it will have coefficients. Well, the coefficients could depend on the matter field as well, because it needn't be linear matter field equations, but it will always look something like this. Now, one question people always ask is, don't I have to use covariant derivatives here? Because if this is already a tensor field, you need to use covariant derivatives. Or even if it's a scalar field, from the second derivative onwards, you need covariant derivatives. Well, these are partial derivatives, but it, they have coefficients, and there is a sum of many. And if you think about this, the lower coefficients, they can provide, for instance, what we call the gamma symbols. 
but maybe in a more complicated geometry, uh, not coming from a metric, maybe you have to generalize the idea of a connection too. We know examples for that. And I don't want to assume any of that. You can't uh, start by saying, oh, maybe if we knew the geometry, then we could do something, but we don't. The point is to find out about the geometry. It's not to already know it. So you start from some matter action that you observe. You write this down, and you have these coefficients, and um, anything is fine because it comes from a matter action. This is fully covariant. The coefficients carry all the non-triviality. Now, the great thing that mathematicians found out is if you want to understand the causality of these equations, so how can signals run, where do I need to put my initial conditions, which is very important for physicists, you don't need to study the whole equation. You only look at the highest order coefficient. So if this goes up to the nth derivative, you look at the coefficient q, a1 to a capital N, the highest order coefficient. It's the only one that's relevant. Yes? Uh, I do, and uh, this is a mistake that, that he keeps in my slides to check the attention of the audience. Uh, so indeed, this should start from zero. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. No, it's really true. I mean, this is every talk. I, I forget to, to correct that. It starts from zero. There can be a constant term. So you look at the height. Yes? Sorry, sorry. A runs from zero to two, three. A. No, A is an index. A1 to AN is the first, uh, uh, the zero, a, a zero to AN is the zeroth index to the nth index. No, it's not true. No, no. A runs from one to N because if N is zero, then there are no derivatives, but there is still the field itself. It's not so important. So the point is, it should read like um, Q phi plus Q A1 del A1 phi plus Q A1 A2 del A1 del A2 phi and so on. Oh, over the dimensions of the manifold. I'm sorry, okay, so I understood, this understood. So on a smooth manifold of dimension D, so this runs over the dimension over what else on the partial derivative? Dimension, dimension of the manifold. Okay, so you look, you only, if you want to understand the causal structure, you only look at the highest order coefficient. What do you do with that? Well, the highest order coefficient, you can plug in a covector K which has an index A1, but you can plug it in several times, such as to fill all these indices. So you make a full contraction. The same covector again and again. What do you get? Well, you get a polynomial, right? Now, um, if this field here, phi, is a tensor field, it carries some indices, then the Q carries double the number of indices because they need to connect to this and from the variation gets these indices and you need to get rid of these indices and the mathematicians instruct us to take the determinant over these indices. To achieve what? To construct overall a polynomial at each point of the underlying manifold and the polynomial is in the K. So it's a polynomial in each cotangent space, right? Because k is a cotangent vector, you submit it at a point at, uh, in, um, in the cotangent space of x, and this right-hand side depends polynomially on this covector. That's what you do, and that's, we're instructed to do this by mathematicians because this is called the principal polynomial of these field equations, and it plays an eminent role in order to understand them. I simplify a little bit. If these equations have um, a gauge symmetry, it works a little differently, but that's not our concern. It can be done. And the point of this polynomial is, if you know this polynomial, you understood almost everything about the ca causal structure of this theory. And I write down for you the polynomial in Einstein theory, if you, uh, from Maxwell theory. If you come from the Maxwell equations, the polynomial is P of x comma k is the inverse metric GAB, KA, KB. This is the principal polynomial of Maxwell theory, and expressions like this we see very often. It's the principal polynomial. But here this is fully general, okay, for any matter theory. Now, if you want to understand the causal structure, what you do, so we're in cotangent space, so we go to one point of the manifold, and we can do this at every point, but now I fix one point, we go to one point, 
And then what I draw here is the cotangent space at that point. It's a vector space, the cotangent space. And this shape here, these are the zeros of the, do of the principal polynomial. So in Maxwell theory, it's all those k where this thing is zero. And how does that look in Maxwell theory? It looks like that. Yes? Can this k be related to the generalized momentum in Lagrangian? It is that one. It, uh, the k, if you do the geometric optical limit of the field equations, then this is the wave covector. So it would be the momentum, if you wish, of the light ray in the geometric optical limit. Okay? So this is, of course, a key structure. I introduced the whole space-time structure to you via these cones. It's a key structure. Well, for another theory that's not Maxwell theory, a bit more complicated, it could actually look like this. Okay? So then you would have to write down a gravity theory, a space-time theory, with such a cone. Or it could look even worse. It could have any type of shape, right, uh, well, which arises as the zero shape of such a polynomial that comes from your metafield equations, okay? So this is the first thing where you see, okay, there's something terribly different to the standard case. But it could well be that that happens. For instance, uh, a while ago, um, it was claimed that neutrinos run faster than the speed of light. Have you heard that in the press? So if that had been true, then there would be a cone from Maxwell theory because light would still be there. And there would have been another cone, something like this, from the neutrinos. Well, you see, it's not excluded that somebody could have written down equations describing that. It would be these equations where the zero set of the principal polynomial that you calculate has this structure. And people gave interviews in the New York Times and so on. They said, well, if this is true, then we are at absolutely at zero. We don't know how to do any physics anymore. Well, it's not quite so bad, right? OK, so, so please follow the talk. So you can have that. And so this is the kernel, this is the zero set of this polynomial. Now we can play a game. And the game is, I don't want to know the structure in the cotangent space. I want to know a rele uh, relevant structure induced by it in the tangent space. And what you can do, you can look at the gradients of this uh, surface. And, um, well, if this is a, co a surface in cotangent space, then the gradient is a vector. Well, the, the gradient in, in tangent space would be a covector. That's what I always emphasize. But here we, are, we already have one star. We have the star star. The gradient to this surface is a vector. So we can take this vector and uh, map it by by the, actually the derivative map of this guy to tangent space. So that's the origin of the tangent space at the same point of the manifold, right? And uh, we have this gradient, and we can draw it in tangent space. Well, I can take a gradient at any other point. I can take this gradient, and I draw it in tangent space. And if I do this for all the gradients, then I get a new figure, a new shape in tangent space. In this case, you would get this shape, OK? So that means a shape like this, the zero set of the principal polynomial that comes from the field equations, immediately induces a shape in the tangent space via this construction. This is how you do it graphically. Uh, you have to take the fiber derivative if you want to do it mathematically. Yes? Um, what in this cone that we uh, uh, know about, we have interpreted this space the, the outside the cone that you, you cannot um, go there and particle. Yes. We'll come there. Okay. We'll come there. We'll come there. If this is in cotangent space at a point in Maxwell theory, then the corresponding picture in tangent space boringly looks very similar. Okay? So in this case, it looks like this. And there are other cases where it, it looks more interesting. Okay. So anyway, we came from meta theory. This was imposed on us. We can, however, generate these structures in the tangent and cotangent space. And they will have to take the role that these guys took in Maxwell theory. Again, why are these structures important? They're important because they in contain the information about the causal structure of the theory. I I'll comment on that further. And um, actually, if you find such this shape in the tangent space, you can ask, is there a polynomial in the tangent space from which, in turn, this shape derives as the zero set? This was the zero set of a polynomial here that we derived from the metafield equations. 
then we make this construction, but is there an underlying polynomial that produces the shape? And the answer is yes, and this is called the dual polynomial, and it's totally determined by this polynomial. You have a polynomial on a cotangent space, fine, you have a dual polynomial on the tangent space. Well, not always, not always, but we will see that our predictivity condition ensures that if you have a polynomial here underlying, then they have a polynomial there underlying, and you can understand these two shapes by these two polynomials. And in, in uh, Lorentzian space-time, if here in the cotangent space the polynomial was essentially given by the inverse metric, then the polynomial here is essentially given by the metric. But that this is the inverse of this one, well, that's just kind of an accident of linear algebra. Uh, it should be more suitably called, if you call this G inverse, you may call this G inverse, <laughs> but the metric is the dual of the inverse metric. Okay? So that's the abstract logic beyond the special case. Okay? So you have this. It's all very straightforward. Um, and you have a map that points back. Okay? So you can go back and forth, but careful, not with any vector, only with a vector that lies, or covector that lies on the surface, you'll map it to a vector lying on the surface. Okay. So, now, I showed you these cones. Somebody wrote down some theory. We don't know is the theory predictive. And that's the first thing you must check if somebody hands you a theory. And by predictive, I do not mean does it make the right predictions we observe. Well, that we have to check. But the question is, does the theory predict from data today actually data tomorrow? Does it even have the power to predict? And if it has the power to predict, then you can start questioning whether it predicts the right thing, right? It needs to go in that order. And so that's the first thing. And the second thing is that matter is quantum matter. I said those are the two bottom line assumptions we make. And now, what bearing does that have on the shape of these guys? How is the shape restricted? Well, the key result, first in words, and then I'll show you what it means, is that if you have matter field dynamics from which we started, and you require them to be predictive, you must have that the polynomial P in each cotangent space is a so-called hyperbolic polynomial. What that is, I'll tell you in a second. It's an algebraic property that you can quickly check. Okay? Just, I'll explain that in a second. Now it turns out, and so this is uh, long known. So this is uh, standard PDE theory, uh, linear PDE theory, that you actually productivity has as a necessary condition the hyperbolicity, hyperbolicity of the uh, principal polynomial. That's why it's so interesting, right? Because you always want to decide that. Now a new result is that if the matter field dynamics are quantizable, a necessary condition for that is that this dual polynomial be also a hyperbolic polynomial. It's a different polynomial living in the dual space, but if this polynomial has the property of being hyperbolic, I'll explain in a second what it is, then it does by no means follow that the dual is hyperbolic. But if you have that too, those are necessary conditions for our basic assumptions that we make about matter. Okay. And similarly, you can argue for point particle dynamics. So we call this bihyperbolicity, and this, uh, these are two independent and rather non-negotiable reasons we should we would like to give for this um, hyperbolicity that the theory is predictive and quantizable. Otherwise, we would throw away the theory in the first instance. Okay. So this bihyperbolicity is important. So I should tell you what this hyperbolicity condition on the polynomials is. It's very simple. I'll explain it geometrically, and then we can think about what it means further. Geometrically, it means the following. Let's start with our familiar example. We have a light cone, right? It comes from a second-degree polynomial metric with Lorentzian signature. A polynomial with this zero set is called hyperbolic if there exists a direction. So this is the start in, uh, uh, in cotangent space, the origin. There exists a direction in cotangent space. This one, or this one, or this one. There must be only one. There exists one such that I can consider any line in the entire space that goes in the same direction. So there could be a line uh, that is over here, or over here, and it's an infinite line. 
Okay? So there exists a direction such that every line in this direction intersects the surface exactly twice. Why twice? Well, exactly as often as the degree of the polynomial is. Because this is a second degree polynomial null surface, there must exist a direction, if it's hyperbolic, then there must exist a direction that any line in that direction intersects the cone as often as its degree says. And that's already the general definition of hyperbolicity. Take this funny thing here. Um, there exists a direction in this case, this one for instance, any line in the space, also the one right over here, right, right over here, needs to still intersect the shape, this is a fourth degree polynomial, one, two, three, four times. Let's go back here. This direction here is not a direction that identifies this as a hyperbolic um, polynomial because the line here doesn't touch the cone at all. Now the cone is here like this, like this, and this line runs over here. It just, just simply doesn't touch it. Yes? Pardon me? Yes, so the point is what happens if you come to the origin here? It seems to intersect only once, but um, you count them not geometrically, but algebraically. So the algebraic multiplicity, there are two zeros here, two roots, okay? That's the, the counting scheme. <coughs> so it's very simple to decide that. And um, in fact, the set of all the directions that have this property that any line in their direction intersects as often as the polynomial says, has an interesting, is an interesting structure for us. It's called the hyperbolicity cone. And uh, it's those guys here and also the guys that point down here. So in normal language, we'd say the time-like vectors or something like this, okay? But we don't call them like this. Maybe you realized I, I withstood calling them a lot like this. Um, the hyperbolicity cone, so it's not the total set, but it's the zero doesn't belong to it. It's, the, um, it's a connected component of such vectors. So either this one or that one you can pick. Well, they're both hyperbolicity cones. Later on, we'll make a pick. In the picture over there, the hyperbolicity cone is actually only the set inside here. So although this is a very complicated structure and it can be arbitrarily complicated, you always have a hyper, if the polynomial is hyperbolic, there's a hyperbolicity cone. There's one and there is also another in this case here. And this is by theorem, by Gording, famous theorem, is always an open and a convex cone. So whatever crazy polynomial you have, for us physicists, whatever matter theory you have, you come from, it's an open and a convex cone. That's very important. This is an open and a convex cone. It's extremely important that it's open and convex. You tell me later on or somewhere in the tutorial somebody why, if it's not convex, why you have a stability with fo of photons. Okay, anyway, so uh, that's very important. That's always guaranteed for these guys. And they are uh, hyperbolic. Remember, P is hyperbolic if the theory is predictive. So the stability of photons has a lot to do with the predictivity of the theory. Anyway. So, now what I already showed you is if you have these cones, they, are, they correspond to, say, the, the wave vectors and the light-like vectors, right, in cotangent and tangent space, you can map the null covectors, the p-null covectors to the p-null vectors, like by this fiber map I had before, right? But now we want to do something different. So I have this, I can map the brown stuff to the yellow stuff, but no other vector in the cotangent space can be mapped over here. Or otherwise from here, no other map vector can be mapped back to here. By the way, it's of course raising and, lower, um, raising and lowering of indices, right? Do you see this? If you go here, this is the raising and the lowering of indices. Only here, in general, it's nonlinear, but it exists. But I can only raise and lower indices on the brown and the yellow stuff. That's not good enough. I also need to know how to raise an index on these covectors, how to go over there. And that's not possible by the same map. And instead, what you need is a so-called Legendre map that's also a fiber derivative, but of the ln of the polynomial. And its image might lie rather ugly, in an ugly way over here, but that's just a fact of life. In the Maxwell case here, it's actually very simple. There, also the outer vectors, the null vectors, are mapped with one type of map over here. 
and the vectors inside the cone are mapped by an entirely different type of map, namely by a Legendre map to over here. It's only by accident, because this structure is so simple, that the maps numerically, I almost would like to say, numerically coincide. So they're usually thought of as being one and the same map that maps the null vectors and that maps the time-like vectors. We always use the metric for that. And even worse, one has a meaning of taking a vector out here and you can still, because it's linear algebra, you can extend this linear map rate that raises the index to also mapping space-like co-vectors to space-like vectors. It all seems to be the same thing. Well, here it simply isn't. As soon as the structure is a little bit more complicated, as your meta theory might dictate, it's not as simple and you discover they're structurally different things. So this is now for the inside of a hyperbolicity cone. You go over there and you arrive there. And in fact, you can show, or we showed, that if both the polynomial and its dual are both hyperbolic, as a physicist, you should think, ah, if the meta theory is predictive and quantizable. OK, check. I want that. If this is the case, then also the inverse of this map exists and is unique. Meaning, if you get these structures for some matter type, only if the matter is predictive and quantizable, which is however exactly what we want, do you have a theory of raising and lowering indices also on elements in the, browns, in the brown areas here. OK? Only remains the question, what about the vectors that lie neither on the boundary here, on the null surface, nor in here? maybe here outside or here in between, and the answer is, we don't know, it's probably not possible, and we don't care. It's not important. My claim is, also in standard theory, you never need to raise the index of a space-like vector. It has no physical meaning. You can do it because your linear map extends to it, so if you can do it, do it if you must, but there is no point in the theory where you need to do that but you need very often to raise and lower the index on a, a null vector or on a time-like vector, a co-vector here, right? Okay, so the Legendre, this one is called the Gauss map for historical reasons, and this one is called the Legendre map. And again, in the standard theory, they coincide, so nobody talks about the difference, but it's a huge difference because the Gauss map is actually something um, uh, from projective algebraic geometry. Algebraic geometry is the study of the zero surfaces of polynomials. And the Legendre map is an object from convex analysis. So because we always have open and convex cones, we have con um, Legendre maps. Yes? I've got a rhetorical question. Yes. Um, this Legendre map, I guess it has been discovered by Legendre. <laughs> No, 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 no. So in convex analysis, no, no. It's not Lee, we found the inverse for the Legendre map. This is well-established theory. But the point is, in this context, right, it's, um, one needs to work a little to see that it can be applied. Okay? So in this context, coming in space-time for hyperbolic polynomials, so you can have a Legendre map for any convex function on a convex cone, or rather stricter conditions if the cone has a boundary. So normally in classical mechanics, where we do the Legendre transformation to go to the Hamiltonian formalism, or in um, statistical physics, where we do the Legendre transformation to go to other potentials, right? you always act on a whole vector space, and a whole vector space is a special case of a cone. A cone is like, I think I explained this before, it's like a vector subspace. So you can, the sum of two vectors in a cone is again a, a vector in the cone, and uh, the positive multiples of a vector in the cone. Well, that's of course true for the entire vector space. And then some subtleties of the Legendre transformation are not seen. So therefore we think, oh, you can always do the Legendre transformation. Actually, if the domain is a cone with a boundary, that's a little more restricted. Okay. Anyway, so the message I want to convey is very simple. You come from some meta model that you propose. If it's predictive and quantizable, the polynomial must be bihyperbolic, as the polynomial must be hyperbolic, and the dual polynomial must be hyperbolic too. If it isn't, you can immediately throw out the theory. Yes? So, uh, has it been light materials with the simulation Well, yeah, I mean, you could, for instance, I mean, this is a special cone. If you had a cone like this one, uh, then the hyperbolicity cone 
So a double cone like this, the hyperbolicity cone would be like here. Uh, you could uh, think that light runs here and that the neutrinos then run here and there is no problem. Uh, well, there is, I say there's no problem. You have these structures, right? Uh, you might here in the first case think which is the relevant cone. Well, for what it's worth, it's this uh, uh, hyperbolicity cone, but this stuff is also there. I show you how to deal with this, okay? That's the purpose of the whole talk. But absolutely, if you had Maxwell theory and neutrinos and the cone structure was that simple, it could be even more complicated to explain the case, uh, we know how to deal with it. It's not a big mystery. It's not the theory is totally dead. Well, general relativity is, but the general idea isn't. That's what I'm trying to explain. Okay, so um, we have this Legendre map too. Now, you have the complicated cone structure. What's the physical significance? I just need to tell you this. You trust me that this is true. We checked this. We have many theorems uh, proven on that. It's roughly as follows. So you have the cotangent space. You have this polynomial. And the null covectors are the momenta of massless particles. Well, it doesn't surprise you very much because that is exactly what it is here. But th it is that, not because we generalize from here, but because this is the general idea of massless momenta from, geometric, uh, from the geometric limit of optics. So it's rather like because in the general case, the massless momenta lie here, that's also the explanation why they lay, lie there. Did I explain to you why the massless momenta are the covectors on the, on the null cone? I didn't. Okay, This is the explanation. That's the reason. And the moment, the covectors in the hyperbolicity cone are the momenta of massive particles. Again, that fully coincides here with the so-called time-like covectors being the covectors of massive particles. Then you map them over here. Then you get the tangent vectors of null particles, of massless particles. And you get the tangent vectors of massive particles. Okay, And the space-like co-vectors, of what should they be the momenta? And their image under raising the index, the space-like vectors, of what should they be the tangent vectors? Well, certainly not of matter. You don't need it. OK? That's the reason why you don't need it. Anyway, you have this. And then you go to the dual space, to the tangent space. And there you have, again, the masses particle velocities, as I just said, and the image of this cone, which does not coincide with the hyperbolicity cone here, which in general is bigger than that, that's the massive particle velocities. The fact that this one is bigger than this inner cone here has funny consequences. For instance, in general theories that are not precisely this one, you can have massive observers that run alongside some component of light. For instance, in this by refringent electrodynamics, this would not be different matter, but would be one and the other polarization component of light running like this or this. This is why it does that. So in matter, this is reality. Okay? In vacuum, we don't know. But in matter, it already looks like this. Huh? So this is not fantasy. This, you, if you're a material physicist, you say, OK, yeah, yeah, I, I know this stuff. I mean, not in this form. They don't, but um, morally, morally. Okay, but here, so you can run with ma massive matter along one component of light. And you can even run faster than some component of light. You just cannot run faster than the fastest light. That you can't do. Okay, and that gives you effects like Cherenkov radiation in here. Uh, but if this also happens in vacuum, also there. Now you say, okay, why would it happen in vacuum? Uh, uh, it happens in matter. Well, who would have thought that in vacuum you could have lensing, right? So it's just the assumption is only like maybe the vacuum is as rich in structure as matter is. I mean, it could be possible, right? Anyway, so this is the, the picture here, and that's the physical significance of these. Now, what is the meaning of this hyperbolicity cone here? Well, it's the velocities of possible observers. You know that in standard general relativity, the observer always runs along a time-like uh, curve. And a time-like curve is, of course, the hyperbolicity cone of the dual. So you say, ah, yeah, all the matter and all the observers all on time-like curves. Well, here it turns out not any matter can act as an observer. Why not? Well, first of all, they can't. Otherwise, the whole picture becomes 
uh, ill-defined. So it's a constraint that comes from a well definition of the theory. And if you then calculate what happens to the matter that runs faster than, a, than an observer, you see that it will very quickly radiate away. So you, you could say, poetically, you can break the speed limit, the lower speed limit, but you pay a price for it, you radiate away. Okay? So in nature, we wouldn't see much of these particles because they would immediately radiate away. They would immediately lose energy to the electromagnetic field, say, and fall back into here, which would have been, if this had been true with the superluminal neutrinos, would have been a beautiful explanation why never anybody saw them before because they're very unstable. And so we were surprised why they would be so stable. And therefore, we didn't believe the result. Other people didn't believe the result for other reasons. In fact, the result was wrong because they didn't plug the socket right or something. But, uh, um, but, but this is the case. So I'm just talking about things that could come up from meta theories, right? Just talking about this. I'm not saying this is how nature is or this is my proposal for nature. I say if you write down new meta theories, they can be perfectly predictive, perfectly quantizable, and have this feature. Well, maybe we'll have to live with that feature. Right? So usually it's assumed if the theory isn't like this, it's not predictive. That is just wrong. Right? Open any mathematics book. Okay. Yes? So the, the inverse of the Le Chatre map has a bigger domain than the hyperbolicity domain, the, or can have a bigger domain. Uh, uh, than the hyperbolic. Yes, that's right. So when, when you started out with the principal polynomial, you wrote the indices on the coefficients up, so that suggests that we plug in a covector, but there's no Yes. You, yes, you have to keep in mind whether it's the velocity of a massless or a massive particle. There's a very easy thing. I can ask an exam question, which I, of course, won't ask because it's just a special case of this theory, is, is this a tangent vector of a, li uh, of a massive or a massless particle? You say, well, of course, it's of a massive particle. Well, in that theory, you don't really know. Well, you, you do, because, I mean, okay, for, for this one, you do. If I ask, is this the, um, the, the tension vector of a massless particle? Here you say yes. In that theory, you don't really know, because there could be other massless particles, and this could be either the velocity of a massive particle, meaning having this momentum, and the very same tension vector could be the tension vector, could be the tension vector of a massless particle. These two are mapped to this one. And they say, okay, so it's two to one. No, because this one is mapped with a Legendre map to here, and this one is mapped with the Gauss map. And under the inverse of the Gauss map, this one will go back here, and under the inverse of the Legendre map, this one will go here. There is no problem. But it confuses one at first sight, because one is used to be able to tell, right? But why would you be able to tell from just a picture? You need to keep it in mind. Well, the theory has it in mind anyway. Okay, so th th there are these confusions that come up precisely because of that, and therefore I emphasize the different character of these maps. And again, nothing if this is a model, this is all mathematics, it just must be like that. Okay, so at this point we arrive at a refined physical definition of space time. You remember, I provided in the course at the beginning this definition of space time, the Lorentzian manifold, blah, 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 blah. Okay, now we have a refined definition of which, of course, the definition I gave you is a special case, but it leaves out important aspects. Space-time is a triple. Well, for us it was whatever it was, uh, uh, a 16-member uh, 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 tuple. Um, I have, of course, here a smooth manifold. So the O and the A and so on, you, you all keep in mind. So it's a smooth manifold. But that is the smooth manifold. Then I have some tensor G, which I call the geometry, it could have four indices, like here. It could have 26 indices, 10 up and 16 down. It could have all crazy symmetries. It could be several of those, right? I mean, this is just to convey the idea. And all of that we had before. We have the smooth manifold. We had a geometric structure. It was a Lorentz symmetric, a special case. But I did not say that a space-time consists of a smooth manifold and a geometric structure and a matter action. I didn't talk about matter actions until very late, you remember? In fact, what I should have written is space-time is a smooth manifold with a Lorentzian metric, in order to introduce the standard theory, and the Maxwell action. Why? 
because I do not have the slightest clue how to interpret this structure if I do not use matter to probe it. I can say, I can claim in this room here we have a Riemannian metric. I mean in space-time, in our portion, of the, there's a Riemannian metric, plus, 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 plus. And then we can have long philosophical discussions whether that's a good idea or not. But what you really have to do, you have to check. You have to use matter to probe the structure of space-time. For instance, you have to look at Mercury. That's matter. It goes around the sun and it makes this little precession and so on. So you say, ah, okay, so if I really want to understand this and with the light deflection and so on, there must be a Lorentzian metric. Then I have Maxwell theory. It must be a Lorentzian metric because Maxwell theory on a Riemannian metric is not predictive. The hyperbolicity in the metric case means Lorentzian signature. That's the next thing that's explained. So if you ask, why do we take a Lorentzian metric? Actually, somebody asked me that the other day. It's a very clear answer. If you do Maxwell theory on a, non on a metric background, but it's not a Lorentz metric, then from initial data, you cannot predict the future data. You simply cannot. Okay. Here's your explanation for the Lorentz signature, but in general, it's not, there's nothing about signature, it's about the bihyperbolicity of the polynomial. So I say, if you want to talk about space-time in a meaningful way, say it's this manifold, say it's this geometric structure, but then tell me which matter you use, and only that gives meaning to the geometric structure. So it's a smooth manifold, so if you G, which we call the geometry because we like to, and a test matter action, matter that probes this. And this triple must be such that the associated po principal polynomial and its dual that you get from the matter action are both hyperbolic. So this is, in a sense, the Lorentzian condition in the metric case. In the, if you take a metric, a Maxwell theory, that's the Lorentzian condition. And of course, you can write, and you need a time orientation, da, 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 that you can all put on top. This is the essential thing. It makes no sense to ask, is space-time maybe does it maybe have this structure? You need to ask, does it have this structure combined with that and that matter theory being coupled to this structure? Then we start talking, and then you're closer to experiment. The question whether metric, the space-time geometry is a metric geometry is a philosophical question. How would I ever test this? Use matter, so you need to provide the matter in order to make a coherent whole. So, Matter and space-time are not so separated as one thinks, not even in the basic interpretation. And if you now think historically, this is exactly what happened. Einstein stared at the Maxwell equations, and he saw, oh, there's this relativistic stuff in there. And the whole interpretation of observers and measurements and all of that was fixed. Einstein didn't dream this up. It was fixed by the Maxwell equations, and this formalizes this. But we don't need a new Einstein to do this. We just look at the mathematical structure of the theory and say, oh, OK, we do it like Einstein, but with the mathematics we have here. OK? So that's the, that's the good thing. And so what I want to emphasize is that the physicality of the assumed space-time geometry depends on the matter. And I have here three exclamation marks, always difficult to remember. So I think the first exclamation mark is that I say, isn't that remarkable? <laughs> isn't that remarkable that we need to provide matter in order to understand what we're even talking about, even if I put the geometry on the table? Second, it's remarkable because it explains so many of the questions some people did ask and other questions people could have asked. Why do you use a metric? Well, because it underlies Maxwell theory. Why do you use a Lorentzian metric? Well, because otherwise Maxwell theory is not predictive. Why do you raise and lower the indices like this? Well, because you always need to, because that's the duality between the spaces. Why do you raise and lower null and time-like vector indices, uh, co-vector indices and vector indices <coughs> in the same way? I say, well, that's an accident. <laughs> okay, that is not generic. But you see, the history of modifying gravity, of doing it differently, is a long and winding one. And many proposals have been put forward by Einstein himself, for instance, to have a non-symmetric metric tensor. He says, why would this metric be symmetric in its two indices? Maybe if we have a non-symmetric one, we have more degrees of freedom, maybe we can have a better theory that explains more as more refined and so on. And then they started constructing inverses of this object, right? And that is where the whole trouble starts, because why do you do an inverse? Well, because that's the structural, the formal analogy to what you do in GR. 
well, formal analogies mean very little. You need to understand why you did it in GR like this, and then you can follow the why and do it the same. But don't just copy something formal. And in fact, what you need, you don't know how to go from here to here unless you have matter. If you have matter, it's the matter that tells you how to go from here to here. It's the principal polynomial that tells you how to go from here to here. But the principal polynomial you get from this structure G only by looking at matter whose principal polynomial that is. And so then one understands why on earth, if you have a matter action, say for a point particle, why you actually need to write why the point particle has actually this Lagrangian. Why does it have this Lagrangian? Well, because if you from this Lagrangian, you see how you have to raise in lower indices, you know that the momentum index is something like this. You pull the index on the velocity and you get the momentum. But the velocity is a kinematical quantity and the momentum always re um, depends on your Lagrangian. You know that from classical mechanics. You cannot calculate a momentum without knowing the dynamics. Well, but if this is the association of momenta to velocities, how on earth would you make them if you don't know what matter you're talking about? You see, a lot of the stuff we're doing by raising, lowering indices and vectors go to covectors, we do this as if this was written in stone on a Lorentzian manifold. This is only like this because we always substitute Maxwell theory as the one theory that tells us how things go. Okay? Okay, so this is the physicality of the assumed space-time. So, um, and that's only a slight, you see, this is a slight redefinition. It actually is not a redefinition. It just makes precise what before we just introduced tacitly, usually with the statement, this is what Einstein told us. Okay? So, so, so far, again, I emphasize, this is maximally conservative. It's only studying what underlies the standard theory logically, but once you understand this, you can apply it to any matter theory. And that's the beauty of it. It's especially the beauty, in fact, of having so much matter around us that we don't understand matter and energy. Who knows? Who knows? We are prepared here. Okay, so this is this thing. You understand the space-time if you understand matter on it, and before that you understand very little. Now, Everything is fine for a given space-time geometry. I now understand how this works. But how on earth is this new structure that you identify by looking at matter that requires it, how on earth are you going to give this new structure dynamics? Also that has been undertaken quite a lot. Einstein, Schrödinger, Eddington, Moffat, and hundreds of people have tried to formulate new gravitational dynamics for new geometric structures. It's not, it's not an idea that wouldn't present itself. The question is, how do you do it? And I think in the past, people followed too much the formal analogies and always ran against some wall or the other. Well, so let's try to do a little better than that. So let's go to gravitational dynamics. Well, so. This goes very close to what Nico Giulini was telling you about the standard theory, um, but I will try to explain independently of what he said because I do not assume that all of you fully studied that because it's excluded from the exam. But you should. There was a fantastic lecture, and actually what he said is a very important point uh, of understanding gravity, but I'll start anew. Let's look at space-time. So, Again, as always, I have to reduce one dimension because otherwise I cannot draw a picture of space-time. But let's assume here this three-dimensional space is a picture of space-time. And I start with the view, maybe a little Western-centric, of an eternal god. Okay. So how would an eternal god view space-time? Well, he just looks at it. Ta-da! There it is. And he knows the history of the entire universe. So if there is a particle running here, no? So this is uh, 2,000 years ago, this is today, this goes on. Just God, this is, just boom, looks at it and he knows everything at once. Okay? This is uh, a view, and this is a little bit the, the megalomaniac view of theoretical physicists who say space is a four-dimensional manifold, the world line is there, and uh, okay. But in a sense, in space-time, nothing happens because it just, boom, is. 
Okay. Um, obviously, if we had, if we could afford this view, we wouldn't need physics, because I can predict by looking. Ah, <laughs> tomorrow this is going to happen, right? So, okay. Now, however, if you're God, then uh, uh, it's lonely up there. And um, so what you could do, you could play a game. And God says, okay, just for fun, uh, let's, in my space-time, which I overview, let's put some arbitrary surfaces. Okay. And he might put their surfaces that are such that the co-vector is always uh, the dual vector to a... Uh, to a tangent to a world line. In other words, he could say, let's take a space-time hypersurface. I don't know why God would be interested in space-like, sorry, in space-like hypersurfaces, but let's assume he does. That's the game he plays. And um, he has this big geometry sitting in space. It could be a metric, a Lorentzian metric, for instance. And he decides to look at the metric it induces on these surfaces. It's a little bit like me saying, oh, let's put a little sphere here and let's study how the sphere works, right? So it's a little bit, why would I do that? Well, I, I'm, I'm bored, so I study spheres, okay? So he is bored and he studies the spatial hypersurfaces just for fun. And he knows, okay, he knows the induced geometry on this one, on this one, because they all come from the big space-time geometry we're also interested in. And then he continues the game and he says, uh-huh, wouldn't it be funny to study how the geometry on here changes if I slightly deform this hypersurface by a lapse n and by a shi shift n alpha. You remember that from Giulini's lecture? So you, you shift it up a little bit everywhere, and then you move it a little bit, and then you have an infinitesimally close other one. Now God plays this game in two ways. He said, well, I produce the other surface, and then I just look what is there, because he can look. But he can say, but it's a funny game. I take the data here, and I just say how I deform the surface, and I calculate by derivatives how it looks like. And then I compare, and I calculate it right. Okay? Of course, all this is totally silly when God plays this game. It's really just because it's so boring up there. Okay? So that's the God view. And obviously, I will come back to this point. right? So it's a, it's a pedagogical game. So that's God. Now we have us or some of us, the homo sapiens. <laughs> and our access to space-time is different. Our access is we have a very short lifetime, or our experiments have a very short lifetime. I switch them off, on, and then we off again. So this is a little bit this kind of piece. And because of the short lifetime and also because of the finite length of my arms, I have only limited access to space around me. So however big you are and long-lived, your experience is something like this. And also the experience of any experimental apparatus we have. What's the longest running experiment in history? Gerhard? Well, if you don't know, I don't know. I don't know. But anyway, it looks a little bit, <laughs> it looks a little bit like that, OK? So we have a problem. If we want to compete with God in knowing what's going on up here, we're at a serious disadvantage. Very serious. We just don't know. Now, this is Homo sapiens. Now, uh, Homo sapiens sapientissimus, right, <laughs> says, okay, this uh, little piece of cake this is too complicated for me. I make a little abstraction. I linearize what happens away from right now. I linearize that. So instead of collecting data in the piece of cake, he collects data on the plate on which the cake is served. And he linearly approximates what's happening in the cake by providing to this initial data also initial velocities, roughly speaking. And that can also apply to the geometry, right? And Giulini showed this, right? He had the geometric fields and he had the momentum fields. It's a bit funny how geometry has the momentum, but if geometry is just a field, why wouldn't it have a momentum, right? So, but this is just the linearization of we know a little more, but if you want to measure the momentum or say the velocity of a bird, you look once and you look again, and you need a finite lifetime to do that. If you just live in one instant, you can never see velocities. You just see the picture and then you're dead. Okay? <laughs> but, but if you live a little longer, you can look, look again and then you can approximate a velocity. Well, that's roughly this. Okay? So giving initial conditions consisting of a position and a velocity 
is the first step to competing with God because the velocity tells you what happens the very next moment. But that you still get by observation, you must get by observation. Okay, now you have the initial conditions here, position and momentum or velocity or in geometry, initial geometry and the first order change of the geometry, but then your life is over. Okay, more or less. Now, how do you compete with God? Well, you still are not very close to competing with him of saying what happens here. He just looks and you're dead. What do you do? What brings you closer to God? A Hamiltonian. <laughs> a Hamiltonian brings you closer to God. The Hamiltonian eats the initial conditions and evolves them. Isn't that what Hamiltonian mechanics say? Okay, this is it now geometry and velocity. Let's say it's geometry and momentum. It's the same thing. It evolves the initial conditions. So we need Hamiltonians or Lagrangians and whatever is equivalent or equations of motion because we're not God, because we're human. Humans need equations of motions in order to say from the now what is the tomorrow. Is that right? That's exactly it. Haha. -ha. We're, we're close. So how do we, now the question is, what is the Hamiltonian? What is the Hamiltonian that brings me from here to there? Well, that's exactly the question we are asking in this lecture. What is the Hamiltonian of the new gravity theory, or of the old gravity theory for that matter? What is it? Well, it's the Hamiltonian that makes you compete with God. So now we come back to our little God game here. Giulini actually explained this, well, he mentioned it, he said, this constraint algebra, do you remember the H's and the D's? The constraint algebra, he said, you can get from purely kinematical deformation algebras. You don't need to know the dynamics first. You just know the geometry, and you know how to deform one hypersurface in the other, and you know how to study how the data changes. If you know that, you can write down the constraint algebra. Okay, now let's look at this. So the play, uh, game God is playing is actually he's embedding, Giulini called this little e sub t, I call it x sub t, you're embedding the same space, spatial manifold, the same three manifold again and again and again into space time in a certain way. In which way? It doesn't matter. It must be space like surfaces, right? You do embed that. And then you choose coordinates on your space time and you choose co coordinates on your abstract three manifold, okay? And actually, that is, that is the path you actually give it. So, and now the geometry on here is just the pullback of the metric from up here along this embedding map. It's the pullback. Okay, so that's the game God is playing a little bit more diagrammatically, but we did all of that, right? We did pullbacks and stuff like that. Now, God's game that I explained before can be expressed in terms of deformation operators. What do you do? Well, let's start with this one. This is the tangential deformation operator. Did he call it H and D? How did he call it? Uh -huh. Okay. Anyway, the deformation operators. Um, here you use, you say this is the N alpha. That's the shift and the lapse appears up here. That tells you at every point of the manifold, embedded manifold how much you go to the side. And this N here tells you how much you go up. But let's start with how much you go to the side in the direction of the tangent vectors, all fine. And this is just a functional derivative that acts on the geometry. Roughly speaking, this tells you how these data change if you go a little bit to the right. You can only calculate it when you're God because you need the functional derivative, but derivatives mean you need to know it here in order to compare, okay? But anyway, that's the game God plays. A little bit more interesting is this one. You have here the deformation in this direction and the tangent vectors down here to a hypersurface, they're always given. You have a hypersurface embedding and you can always calculate the tangent vectors. But here what you need is a normal vector. But a normal vector you, cannot, you don't get for free. If you have a hypersurface, what you can calculate is a co-normal. You can calculate a normal uh, covector, which if you feed in all the tangent vectors, annihilates it. In other words, you can calculate the gradient to the hypersurface, but the gradient is a covector, okay? We know that. Aha, so if this is embedded and the gradient is a covector, 
we have a problem because in order to go away from the hypersurface in a certain direction, we need to convert the covector, which is more like something like this, into a vector, which is exactly this kind of map. You need to take a hyperbolic covector. Why a hyperbolic one? Because there is the theorem that a hype, an initial data surface must always have a covector, I indicated like this, that lies in the cotangent space inside the hyperbolicity cone. So in order to convert the normal, the gradient to an initial data surface, that's the game we're playing here, in order to convert that gradient into a direction, you need to know how to go from here to here. Agree? But how do you know to go from there to there? You only know if you have matter, if you understand your matter. Only then do you really know that. Thank God we postulated matter in our definition of space-time. It's the matter we postulated. And it will depend on that matter through its principal polynomial of how the hypersurface gradient is converted into a direction that go, can go into here so that you know what you mean by a normal deformation. So in this whole picture, there is one single point where physics comes in. This is all clear. This is all logically clear. But where's the physics coming in? The physics comes in right here. The construction of this normal vector is actually the Legendre image of the gradient of the normal covector of the gradient to the surface. But this Legendre map was, in general terms, not in Einstein theory, but quite generally, the Legendre map was the fiber derivative of the ln of the polynomial. And the inverse Legendre map, going back, was that of the dual polynomial. OK? So the Legendre map takes you there. But this P is the principal polynomial of the matter you have on your space time. So that means if God is playing this game in this divine view of space time, then we can compete with him if we know that the direction that's chosen here is this one. You say, why would, yes? So this is the conversion from momentum to velocity. That is right. That is right. It's the conversion of momentum to velocities for time-like, uh, so for massive momenta. That's right. That's right. And this is the one and only step we identify here, and there will be no further, where physics goes into the derivation of gravity. Exactly there, and it comes from matter. Gravity comes from matter in precisely this point. OK, good. So, aha. So we have that. Now, God plays this game with these linear functional derivative operators. OK, that's an easy game. We, unfortunately, have to play a more complicated game. We have to represent this here, not on the space of all geometries on the space time. We have to represent it as a Poisson bracket action on initial data. You know that if you do a Hamiltonian, well, you can think of this to first order as a, a Hamiltonian acting on positions, you know what you get. You get the Q dots and so on. Now, it turns out the Hamiltonian of gravity is the sum of these two. That's what you actually can check in Giulini's lecture for the special case of Einstein gravity coming from the dynamics. We have to represent these operators here by Poisson bracket operators, where one slot is filled with two representations of these two objects in order to evolve. Well, that's the game we have to play Hamiltonian dynamics. But how on earth are these two guys to be chosen? How does the world work? Well, if you look at this, you say, ah, we could calculate the algebra of these guys and require that these guys satisfy the same algebra because that's the information that's in there. So let's do that. You take these guys, these deformation operators, and you calculate from them the deformation algebra. Now here, this is the degree of the polynomial. This is the polynomial. You, you ask, why does it only have two indices? If a higher degree polynomial it should have many more indices. Well, these are these two, and the remaining ones are filled with the k vector. Anyway, this is the general notion. In Einstein gravity, you have degree p is 2, and this is the inverse of the spatial metric on your hypersurface. But it, this works, this comes out as a calculation. This works in our fully general theory. 
and it must work like that for mathematical reasons. So you have an algebra, it's the algebra of God's little game operators. In order to compete with him, these objects must satisfy the same algebra, because otherwise you're playing a different game. So we want to impose this algebra on these objects, and then we can actually determine these two objects, the ones that represent that, and that is something we did. And it's a very complicated problem because in this algebra, the h's appear squared. I mean, you see h, h, it's a quadratic problem in the h. It's very difficult, and it's not even a Lie algebra. I think Julien also emphasized that um, because uh, here there are no structure constants, there are structure functions. So it's not a Lie algebra, and it makes it very, very difficult and hard, uh, despite the uh, space on which this is formulated being infinite dimensional, geometry space, whatever. The points is a hard problem. But once you solve the problem, I'll show you in a second how to do that, you get these two objects, and the gravitational action one can show looks like this. Meaning, you start with matter, you calculate the principal polynomial, you put it into here, that's the only thing you really need from the matter at the end of the day. You put it into here, you calculate the algebra, this is always the same algebra, you don't even need to repeat the step, you start from here, and you find this representation. Once you have that, you have the gravity Lagrangian. You found the Hamiltonian of the geometry, right? Now, how do you solve this very complicated representation problem? Well, as I said, it's a quadratic representation problem. You can convert it into a linear distribution functional differential equation, still terribly difficult. A linear distributional differential equation, still too difficult. You can finally convert this into a linear, even homogeneous linear, system of partial differential equations. The price you pay is it's incountably infinitely many. Okay? And that's the system you have to solve, and here it is. Okay? Now, the point is this looks terrible, but it's not bad. So <clears throat> this is the Lagrangian of gravity, and you expand it in this case, and you want to calculate these coefficients capital C. If you have them, you have the Lagrangian. Now, for these coefficients capital C with varying number of indices, you have six equations. That's not finitely, infinitely many. You have six, and then you have five sequences. Uh, so that's five times infinity, okay? So you have in total infinitely many equations, and the c's in there are the ones you want to determine because they're the coefficients of your Lagrangian expansion. And the other coefficients, the u and the s and the t and the v and whatever names we gave them, you simply calculate from the principal polynomial. It's a recipe. It's one A4 page recipe, blah, 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 blah. It's very boring, so Max can tell you about how boring it is. So, <laughs> You, you calculate that for the matter type you have, okay? And then you solve the resulting equation. So the equations always have this form. It's only these coefficients change, so the equation coefficients, and then you calculate these Cs that are the coefficients up here. And then you have your gravity theory. Now, um, I mean, it actually is fun to solve that stuff. Uh, particular, say you start with Maxwell theory, you calculate this polynomial, you go in, you calculate the, the U, V, M, Q, T, and S coefficients, you plug them in, you still have infinitely many equations, need to be very organized, and then you start solving them. And then you solve them, and if you start with Maxwell theory, ta-da, in the end, what comes out is that the L up there, expanded in the C's, is the square root of minus G, R plus lambda over all factor 1 over, well, let's say 1 over G. Undetermined, because it's a system of differential equations, you have integration constants. Undetermined, you have integration constants, but that is it. Okay? If you start with Maxwell theory. So Einstein gravity is the gravity theory that produces solutions that are such that Maxwell theory can live on it and is predictive and quantizable. That's the game. Now, so the point is, the problem of finding a gravity theory is not working in a patent office. It's actually solving these equations. Okay? So if you have new matter that you... For, like Maxwell, think always, people talk of Maxwell theory as fundamental theory, like the other standard model. What do you mean by fundamental theory? All physics is phenomenology. 
there comes Ampere, and there comes Faraday, and they worked with their little magnets. I mean, you, you actually, in, in fact, so if you think what this really means, you work with, you, you know these experiments from high school. You have a current running through a wire, and you put your little magnetic needles around it, and they arrange themselves in, in this shape. And the other thing is you have a dynamo on your, on your bike, and it produces light, okay? Because it turns a magnet and tra-la-la. Ampere and Faraday, two very simple things. You put them together, if you're Maxwell, you say, okay, there's a current ter a term missing, the displacement current, in order to get the continuity equation right. Okay, minus stuff, peanuts, okay. So you put this together, but it's actually these two experiments that you do in high school that everybody knows actually about, that imply this, which implies the Big Bang. I mean, this is an amazing stretch of connection, right? That's quite remarkable. Okay, but now assume maybe today the people who look at dark matter or dark energy more likely is a candidate, they look at this and one day some new Faraday and Ampere will come and say, well, I have these nice little equations that explain this stuff and then a new Maxwell comes and says, okay, seriously people, let's put this together in a meaningful way, whatever, whatever the windings of history will be. And I'm fantasizing very clearly. It could all be very very simple, but it could be like they write down new equations. Well, what to do then? Well, very simple. You calculate the principal polynomial, plug them into these equations here, and you solve these equations. However easy or hard that will be. Or other alternative, NASA is looking for this. They're looking for birefringence in vacuum, and they don't find it. Okay, and so they're bounds on that and so on. But I ask, how would you find it? You don't even have a theory that describes this properly. Well, we do. You take Maxwell theory, if it's still linear, if it's still superposition, you take Maxwell theory, but with this Lagrangian, so L Maxwell, or Lagrangian density, is the square root of minus G. You have the FAB, FCD. So normally you would use two metrics to, to tie these together to the F squared action. But now you just use G, A, B, C, D, this kind of object, which gets then induced symmetries like square here and there's an exchange symmetry, whatever. And this is what explains linear super, um, uh, birefringence in materials. It would also explain birefringence, or would encode birefringence in the vacuum. Okay, so here you have a theory. You can calculate the principal polynomial, blah, blah, blah. You, you, you understand the drill. So what one needs to do, and that's actually one of the projects that Marx and other of my students are working on, is to derive the gravity theory that consistently underlies the assumption that there could be something like this in space-time. And then you have a prediction where the effect will be strong. If you just point your telescope somewhere and say, oh, I don't see birefringence, that's not particularly convincing. You can't also point your telescope somewhere and then say, oh, there is uh, slight bending. You, you need to look precisely where it is. Or we get, yesterday you calculated the radiation of the binary pulsar. You need to know what you're looking for in order to discover that object, right? Otherwise, it's not a Nobel Prize if everybody can see it, right? And so the point is you can calculate the gravity theory underlying. So even if you don't wait for dark energy to be somehow put into equations in 100 years in order to carry this through, you can ask questions many people are asking. But instead of just parameterizing some deviation in the standard theory with an extra term, you have a well-rounded full theory of the matter and the underlying gravity. And it is not Einstein gravity. So the question is, which matter gives you different gravity than Einstein gravity? The answer is, whenever the matter has a principal polynomial that's different from this one. Okay? And that is whenever the principal, the cone of the principal polynomial looks more complicated than the double light cone. It's as simple as that. So every matter, however complicated it is, that has this principal polynomial, that's standard matter. So for instance, one second, for instance, you know, you have the Dirac algebra, right? Who's seen the Dirac algebra? So they in curved space some something like this, so there's something like that, yeah. right? Why? Why? Because Dirac told us so. Well, because, exactly because, if this is the Dirac equation without mass, say, you can calculate the principal polynomial of this. What do you guess it will be? It's PKK equals G inverse KAKB. It's the principal polynomial of Maxwell theory. That is the reason why you need these guys to be like that. 
Dirac matter, standard matter there. Okay. Anyway, I, I could tell a lot about this, but you get the picture. Yes. No, it's, it's very hard to say. So the question you ask is, if you go in with a certain type of matter, you can classify it according to the degree of the principal polynomial, to the rank of the tensor that underlies it and whatnot. The answer to your question, how many degrees of freedom are there in the gravitational theory, requires that for that matter you solve these equations, or you find an abstract way the way of existence and uniqueness and whatever you, huh, uh, to study these equations without solving them. So for instance, the question, is there an alternate, not alternative, is there a gravity theory that can underlie this type of matter whose equations I put down? Is there a gravity theory? That's the question mathematically, the question of existence of a solution of the system. Well, is there one or are there many? Well, that's mathematically the question of uniqueness of solutions. And what on earth is the theory, concretely, so I can calculate? That's the question of practically solving the equations. But all of these are, physical, are mathematical questions. So we converted this grand physical question of what a modified gravity theory could be to input from experiment, observation, matter input, phenomenological input, and then we just carry through what logically is demanded and we convert it into a purely mathematical problem. And it is as hard to find such a new gravity theory as it is to solve these equations. But again, so now you could ask, could one do perturbation theory and so on? These are all stuff, this is all stuff we are following, okay? Yes? Uh, Dirac, the question is specific for spin half particles. Yes. There are some problems very easily fixed. It's still the same principal polynomial. And, uh, stop, stop. Why, why is it the same principal polynomial? Because you only need to look at the highest order term as I instructed you. Okay. And, and what about spinorial tensors in these equations? Um, we don't have them because, as I said, if you start with a smooth manifold as your bottom line, every study needs a bottom line. You start with that as a bottom line then at first you can only consider tensors. Once you identified the principal polynomial with some test matter, right, then you can redo Dirac's question and you can say, I want now also other representations. But now it will not be a binary algebra uh, that you need, but you will need a degree p array algebra. So it's from mu to sigma, and these guys run both, uh, so these are degree p many, because this is the principal polynomial. This is the new Dirac algebra, and it's no longer a problem of binary algebra where you have two entries. It's a problem with degree p many entries. And one can show that. So that's what one of my PhD students studied amongst other things on, on these space times, how you can establish non-tensorial matter. That is how it goes. And in a special case where the polynomial is the metric, it looks like this. This is why the indices are up. Because actually the, the polynomial, the principal polynomial in the Dirac algebra. Okay. Okay, so you solve these guys. So the problem of finding modified gravities theories, but modified always sounds like we, we want to modify. We don't want to modify, but if matter demands it, we will, and that's the way to do it. It's a mathematical question. We reduce it to a purely mathematical question. There are no free parameters in the theory. It's not of the type you add some terms and then, oh, they're so highly suppressed, but I still believe in it or something. You get these equations and they are what they are. You solve them and you will get parameters because they're differential equations. You will get undetermined stuff and see how useful that is, right? And then the only thing you need to make